Thank you for joining us uh, for the first of these years, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Book Club Conversations. We're very excited to have you join and be part of the discussion. We host these quarterly uh, virtual gatherings to allow members access to social justice activists, journalists, authors, um, to engage on current human rights issues and dive a bit deeper into our programmatic work as it relates to the chosen book. So before we do that, I just have a few housekeeping uh, reminders before we jump in. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will have a dedicated opportunity for questions and answers with the audience. So please be sure to enter questions throughout the conversation via the chat and Nisa and I will share them with our authors during the Q&A phase. I am Angelita Vines and I am the VP of the RFK Human Rights International Advocacy and Litigation Program. And it is my pleasure to lead today's conversation on a fantastic and very thought-provoking book, which was published last year, that anyone that cares about human rights should read, and it's The Coming Good Society. We're very fortunate to have both co-authors today uh, with us. at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She brings a rich and diverse background on philanthropy, human rights, and social justice through her work in the US and globally with the Ford Foundation and the Open Society Foundations, as well as her experience leading human rights programs, philanthropic collaboratives, and social justice foundations. She has also taught graduate public policy courses on global civil society, the state, and the NGO sector, intersectoral leadership, as well as nonprofit policy and management at the University of Southern California and the University of California at Los Angeles. Sujma has been an adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School for the past two years after, or maybe more now, three years after graduating from mid-career MPA program from the school in 2013, where she was awarded the Lucius Lee Tower Fellowship in recognition of her academic achievements and leadership role within the community. And Sujma Raman is also in our board of directors. Uh, on his hand, Dr. William Schultz is currently a senior fellow at Carr Center and has also decades of human rights experience. From 2010 uh, till 2020, Dr. Schultz served as an affiliated professor of preaching and public ethics at Midville, Midville Lombard Theological School. He is the president emeritus of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, which he led uh, between 2010 and 2016. And as executive director of Amnesty International USA from 1994 to 2006, Dr. Schultz headed the American section of the world's oldest and largest, in, largest international human rights organization. He was a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and has served as a consultant to a variety of foundations, including the MacArthur Foundation, the UN Foundation, Humanity United, and the Kellogg Foundation. He was appointed adjunct professor of public administration at New York University's Wagner School of Public Policy in 2008, where he taught for eight years, and in 2013 served as Posen Visiting Professor of Human Rights at the University of Chicago. Both Sushma and Bill have been judges of the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award, which as you know is an award the organization gives out every year to recognize some of the bravest human rights defenders around the world. I'm gonna now uh, give the floor first to Sushma to um, have, give us some opening remarks and then to Bill, if that's okay by both of you. Sushma, please. Thank you so much, uh, Angelita, and thank you to the RFK uh, community for inviting us to this conversation. Uh, I actually first met Bill through um, the judging process many years ago. And it was really a, a privilege to be part of that process where we got to meet amazing laureates from around the world doing really incredible work, uh, you know, tackling really insurmountable odds. And, and you could see their progress over the years, uh, thanks to the support of your wonderful staff and donors and board and so on. So I was really privileged and honored to work with Bill on this book, The Coming Good Society. And our thinking was that the human rights movement is often mired in the current day conflicts, uh, the issues of the day. And while we've made significant progress over the past 70 years in terms of improving opportunity and access for many communities around the world, much remains to be done. So we approached this book thinking about how do we, um, a phrase that we used in the book is, how do we provoke rather than predict? So the book doesn't necessarily attempt to identify each and every right that it needs to be either reconceptualized or introduced as a new right, 
would rather um, raise several questions for us to consider and for us to assess how do we deal with the um, impact of scientific and technological advancements and norms changes on uh, societies around the world. So I'll just stop there and then turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Sushma, and to RFK, Analita, Nisa. It's delightful to be with you today. I have great affection for RFK and, of course, for Carrie Kennedy, an old, old friend. Uh, my background, as Analita mentioned, is as a Unitarian Universalist minister, and I was very active in a wide variety of human rights and social justice causes when I was president of the Unitarian Universalist denomination in the late 80s and early 90s, and then had the privilege of being called to the executive director of Amnesty International, which I served for 12 years until 2006. Really for me, the, the germ of this book arose during my amnesty years. As uh, for example, I saw the emergence of a recognition of LGBT rights during those years, which had not previously been uh, rights that were widely recognized or accepted uh, by even the human rights community itself. And during that period, I asked myself, well, you know, if, if this is a new right that is emerging, what other rights might there be on the horizon 10, 20, 30 years from now that future generations will recognize that we today don't have uh, in our wheelhouses? And it was really that question that provoked me to think about this issue but I actually didn't have the opportunity to write about it until recently when I was a senior fellow at CAR and I had the opportunity to work for Sushma. So for me, that's the background of this book and my interest in the topic. Thank you both. I, I, the other question I think that can get us started in, in, with the conversation and before we really delve into the content of the book and the ideas that you expose there is, learning a bit more about what, um, about yourselves and specifically what, how did you come to devote yourselves to a, a, a career in human rights? Who wants to start? Bill, do you want to start? Well, uh, I, on one level, my uh, devotion to human rights began in grade school when I confronted bullies, or rather I should say the bullies confronted me, <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, uh, I really developed, uh, this was an all-male school uh, in the very traditional uh, English uh, prep school model uh, where harassment was very much a part of the culture of the, of the institution. And, and I really developed uh, a hatred for bullies. And I think that in a more sophisticated form, uh, my human rights work uh, allowed me an opportunity to, uh, to address that, that issue. Uh, but as I said, as a Unitarian Universalist minister, that is a denomination that is very committed to the worth and dignity of every human being and uh, the honoring of everyone's full flourishing as a human being. And there couldn't have been a, a more easy transition for me from that role as president of that denomination to a human rights organization where the dignity of every person is at the heart of the work that, that we did at Amnesty and that all of us continue to do in the human rights movement. In, in my case, I was born and raised in India. And I think at the time, um, some of the issues that I confronted were around migration and refugees, um, extreme poverty and inequality, the status of women and girls, and I think I carried that uh, sense of uh, commitment to social justice when I came to the US to go to college, got involved in activism, uh, did work on Central America. And um, so I think I've been committed to work on social justice broadly defined in different ways, whether it's in the philanthropic sector or in the NGO space or now in academia. Thank you. Now, delving into the book, um, you point out that the process of rights change is not always a linear one, and that even sometimes rights do not change in a progressive direction, but rather in a regressive direction. Are there any particular rights or their interpretation that you think may be at risk right now uh, in these current times of going backwards or devolving? <laughs> 
So I, I think it's important to start first with an understanding of how we define human rights. And then perhaps Sushma can say a word about regression. So most of the time when we think about human rights, we think of them as something that we possess, something inside us. We say, I have the right to free speech or I have the right to freedom of religion. But in our book, we make the argument that rights are not something inside us. Rights are really a description of our ideal relationship with one another and with the world around us. In other words, that rights are transactional, that they describe a good society and what we want uh, in our relationships of dignity and flourishing with one another and the world around us. And with that understanding of rights, it means that while of course human rights may be at the core of all that we do, it's possible that there are other entities in the world with whom we want to be in relationship in a certain way that we will then assign rights to. And that uh, in, the, in the book we treat of animals, robots, nature itself, and we'll talk more about that later in our conversation. But I think it's important to understand first our understanding of rights. Now, that means that of course it's possible that rights will devolve or regress. And it's something that we have to be devoted to making sure uh, isn't the case, that they continue to move in a progressive direction. Susan? Yeah, so I, you know, in terms of the rights that are currently under attack or that where we fear regression, there, there are so many, but I'll point to the rights of um, uh, freedom of association, assembly, uh, freedom of speech, uh, which are increasingly under attack in um, around the world, in authoritarian societies, but also in democracies. Uh, in the United States over the past year, we've seen attacks on people who are mobilizing peacefully um, around Black Lives Matter. And of course, in countries around the world, from Russia to India, we are seeing um, punishment of human rights defenders and citizens who are mobilizing peacefully to ensure greater democratic space and, and equity. I'll also flag um, you know, the effects of these punitive measures on environmental defenders, human rights defenders, uh, indigenous communities, uh, women human rights defenders, LGBTQ activists, uh, many of those who are most marginalized and most affected by these repressive laws and regulations are also um, at fear of their lives being lost or being under attack or uh, torture and so on. Uh, there's of course many more issues to confront as we think about how we emerge from the pandemic. We've seen um, in extreme inequity within and across societies being exacerbated. One of my colleagues referred to the pandemic as a great unequalizer. So as we emerge in the coming months, we have to think about the fact that, um, you know, many places are going back to quote unquote normal, but around the world, governments are using the pandemic as a way to cut back on civil society space and the lack of access to vaccines and um, lack of investments in health, lack of a rights-based approach to health uh, will all affect communities in the global South for years to come. There's much more I could say, but I'll stop there. Now, thank you so much. I mean, one of the reasons why as an organization we've decided to, in the past few years, to really focus more on the protection of civic space is precisely because of what you're pointing out. Now, these increasingly, uh, I mean, effort and trend of, of closing civic space and curtailing basic freedoms, such as uh, freedom of expression, association, and assembly. And, um, and the impact it has in other rights as well, of course, because if you, um, both in, in, in more authoritarian, uh, but also in so-called democratic uh, societies, if, if uh, in countries, if organizations don't have the ability to operate, to speak out and to organize, uh, then that, that has implications for, for many rights and many populations, particularly those that are in a situation of vulnerability. And in, in the discussion of, of about rights, um, including attempts to establish a, her 
uh, hierarchy of rights and, and fighting back uh, a so-called proliferation of rights, which is a criticism that you do point out um, from certain sectors in, in, in the book was notably put at the forefront of Secretary uh, Pompeo's agenda with the establishment of a commission on unalienable rights, which RFK Human Rights together with other organizations sued. And the ideas proposed by this commission received support at the international level by a number of countries, which incidentally shared uh, traits of authoritarianism and, and disregard for human rights. Sushma, what does this tell you uh, or say about the, the current state of, of the world? And do you think this initiative has set a precedent and, and should the progressive human rights community be concerned about it? Yeah, so for those uh, in the audience who are not aware, uh, Secretary Pompeo established this commission to examine the role of human rights in US foreign policy and which rights should be prioritized and honored. And this, of course, raised alarm bells among many in the human rights community, but also beyond. And um, as was to be expected, the commission and secretary uh, decided to elevate certain rights over others and uh, question certain rights as being too political and um, this most likely would have affected foreign policy in the future had there been a second term for the administration. If we think of the executive orders and the actions that have taken place on the border, or even uh, President Trump's rhetoric about Uh, rights rollback that have occurred over the past four years, which has greatly uh, weakened our ability to persuade other countries to uh, uh, uphold human rights and the rule of law. I think there's a long way to go to rebuild. And going back to the um, Obama era policies, it's not sufficient because um, there were many, many issues at that time as well. So while we are out of the woods in terms of the past four years of extreme cruelty as a cornerstone of foreign and domestic policy, uh, we still have a long way to go to rebuild um, our efforts within the US and around the world. And Bill, you both remind us in the book um, and throughout the book that human rights are not a zero some game and that expanding existing rights or recognizing new ones doesn't vitiate previously recognized rights. Sometimes rights can be found to be at odds with each other. And you provide examples of that, you know, including the right to privacy or the dilemma that sometimes can be presented with, between the right to privacy and the right to life and personal security in the context of counterterrorism. Um, and while international and national courts uh, and human rights mechanisms have created proportionality test and other tools to help make that determination of what rights should prevail when there is a conflict between them. Um, do you think there is an inher in, in, in here, in inherent, inherent, this is where my accent comes to kick in, inherent priority of rights or should there even be one? And in terms of public policy, which is one excuse we hear quite often from states around the world is like, no, we need to prioritize. So should efforts to guarantee certain rights uh, be more acceptable than others? And how can that then priority be determined if that's something that needs to happen at all? So this is an important and ongoing question. Uh, we talk about human rights as, as being indivisible. And it's certainly true that we shy away from making a hierarchy of rights. But on the other hand, let me ask you a question. If we're going to work on genocide and stopping genocide, and the alternative is to work in support of the right to leisure, which is another right guaranteed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, surely we're going to make a judgment that working on genocide is more important than protecting the right to leisure, lovely as the right to leisure may be. And even within the human rights framework, some rights are recognized as fundamental, as rights that can never be suspended. They're called, in technical terms, non-derogable rights. And these are rights like the right to life or the right not to be tortured that can never be suspended even the face, in the face of a huge emergency. Every human rights organization sets priorities 
And we set those on a wide variety of bases on what we're best equipped to do, on what, where our resources are carrying us. But the reality is that the reason we have international human rights courts is to help us make these decisions, to, to balance rights that may be in conflict with one another. So we don't deny in this book that, that there are some rights that are more important than others. We're simply making a separate point, and it is this. At one point, as Sushma and I were workshopping this book at the Kennedy School, a very distinguished legal human rights legal scholar said to us, well, the rights you're talking about, and we were talking about rights for transgendered persons, for example, or, or the rights of nature. He said, those aren't real rights. The only rights that really matter are fundamental rights, like the right to a fair trial or the right not to be tortured. And uh, I said in response to that, you know, back in 1993, when Hillary Rodham Clinton as the first lady went to Beijing to the International Women's Conference and proclaimed that women's rights are human rights, a statement that today I suspect none of us would find very controversial, what was the response of many, many people back in 1993? The response was, those aren't real rights. Those aren't rights that really count. The more important rights are, and then they reverted just as this legal scholar did to traditional civil and political rights. The whole area of social and economic rights, those were often described within an American context as those aren't real rights. Those aren't important rights or the most important rights. So what we're trying to say in this book is that, who knows, a generation from now, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, there will be a whole set of new real rights, I put that in quotation marks, fundamental rights, maybe even non-derogable rights that we aren't even recognizing today. So the answer to your question, Annalita, is yes, there, there is, whether we like it or not, whether we formalize it or not, there is a hierarchy of rights. There are some rights that are more immediately pressing to defend and Sushma and I are on the front lines of, of advocating for those kinds of defenses, but we don't wanna lose sight of the fact that rights evolve and change and there will be other fundamental rights in the years and generations ahead. Thank you, Bill. And there's one issue that I wanted also to ask you about because it's it's, uh, a topic that we work, a uh, human rights issue that we work quite um, a lot on, which is combating violence against women. And in the book, um, you point out how formal international instruments and, and organizations often reference to gender-based violence in, in, in a way that uh, basically concerning, as, as something concerning only uh, women and very rarely violence against trans or intersex people. And in one of our recent cases, which, you know, fingers crossed, the judgment should be coming out soon, which is the case of Vicky Hernandez versus Honduras, which deals with the murder of a trans woman in 2009, we, we had to argue, and this is because, you know, this is still quite, you know, a, an issue that hasn't been fully developed by courts, we had to argue that the Inter-American Convention on the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which is, you know, a, a regional uh, legal instrument that is specifically focused on eliminating violence against women and is called is known as the Belém do Pará Convention also applied to this case to the case of these trans women uh, murdered in Honduras. So do you think it is more a matter of ensuring that the interpretation of these existing uh, international instruments just as the one I, I, I was referring to or others um, in, in, in extends to include individuals or situations that may not have been fully understood or contemplated or explicitly contemplated when they were drafted? Or should we, in this, using this example, push for adopting a new, more specific binding human rights instrument that explicitly covers uh, issues like violence against transgender individuals, for example? Another good and important question, Halita, and I, I want to first congratulate RFK in this case and in many, many others for the groundbreaking work that you've done uh, in, in areas like this. Um, and again, you know, before there was a convention on the elimination of discrimination against women, exactly this same challenge occurred with regard to violence against women. Can we just subsume it underneath a general recognition that there ought not to be violence against human beings? 
but I think there was a recognition that there is something special, and I mean that in a negative way, about violence against women that requires it being uplifted and uh, addressed in and of itself. And the challenge with regard to uh, transgendered persons is that there are at the moment very few international human rights instruments that speak directly to any of the rights, not just the right uh, to be free of violence, but the right to transition itself. There are very few international human rights instruments that speak explicitly to this. And there really, there's nothing better than having an explicit mention of, of a marginalized group, of a group that is seeking empowerment. There's nothing better than to be explicit and to put on the table in a legal framework, the importance of that particular community of those particular rights. And so that's one reason that while there's a lot of debate within the LGBT activist uh, LGBTQ activist community as to whether uh, they should seek a, a, a separate treaty addressing these kind of rights. My personal opinion is this is critically important. At some point, maybe we're tactically not right there at the moment, but at some point in the future, it's going to be critically important to have a separate convention or treaty covenant with regard to the whole framework of LGBTQ, but particularly in this case, we're talking about the rights of trans persons. Uh, and I think, what do rights do? Rights elevate our concerns and codify them in international law so that they are no longer merely subject to the whims of particular countries or local. We find to rely upon a few enlightened countries for whom an international treaty will be an important challenge and we so Shuma, some people in the audience and maybe you as well have watched the tv show uh, black mirror and remembered i remembered it when reading the book in particular um and in particular when reading the chapters on human rights in an age of the new technology as well as on the limits and potential rights of artificial intelligence and there's one particular real life example that is cited in the book and which seems to be the inspiration of, of one, a Black Mirror episode and is the social credit score system in China. While it seems to be the most far reaching example of uh, digital social control uh, in the world, to some extent in other countries, we already, uh, our behavior and, and social rating um, also has practical examples and, and we could only think for example, about Uber and, and the scores that we get both as users and drivers and how that could affect our access to that type of, uh, of uh, transportation service. Do you think the Chinese model is where we're heading more globally? Yeah, this is a fascinating question and a question that has implications for everyone, uh, no matter where you live, whether you're in a democracy or not. Uh, because we are all affected by the increasing scope of surveillance technology, both at the hands of governments as well as in the hands of corporations. So in terms of China, its uh, technology is really used to monitor every citizen. And the social credit score takes into account um, all of your actions, your behaviors, whether you jaywalk, whether you buy alcohol versus diapers, even who your friends are, or if you click like on a particular social media feed um, on a post that would be seen as you know, not appropriate. And then of course, this level of surveillance extends uh, to ethnic minorities like Uyghurs who are held in mass detention camps. And um, these technologies don't just create a composite image of individuals or communities, but they're also used for what's called predictive policing where individuals are flagged for suspicious behavior. And it could be something as innocuous as um, uh, storing a large amount of food or um, using a large amount of electricity, and that could lead to indefinite detention without charges or trial. Now, this, uh, these systems of surveillance technologies are actually being used around the world, not just in China um, or North Korea, but, um, you know, 
these are happening in many, many countries, especially after 9-11, ostensibly for national security purposes. In 2019, a study by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace found that liberal democracies and uh, developing countries are racing to implement these technological solutions to make borders quote unquote smarter, uh, policing safer, and to monitor all of their citizens. And um, what this does is basically what uh, Princeton professor Ruha Benjamin calls policing without the flesh and blood presence of actual police. And this technology is actually being exported around the world. Um, so Venezuela, for example, is using Chinese technology and know-how to develop and implement a fatherland card to track citizens' voting patterns, uh, political activities, and access to uh, food subsidies. Uganda is using uh, similar technology to surveil political opponents. And um, even in countries like Mexico, um, there was a, a, a disappearance of, of 43 college students, which we write about in, in the book. And the investigators who came to Mexico to investigate the disappearances and likely killings received um, you know, a text. And it was if you clicked on the link, there would have been malware that would is installed on your phone. And, and this is something that is increasingly being um, you know, happening around the world. The development of uh, sort of scores, composite images, uh, tracking of individuals. Um, and this is also in the United States, we're looking at uh, vast amounts of data that is being collected on individuals uh, that is being used both by government as well as by private companies. So this is definitely something that we should be concerned with and it really affects the exercising of a range of our rights the right to privacy, most notably, but a range of other rights, the right to freedom of movement, free expression, and the ability of people to organize and to protest um, and to sort of claim their civic space. And turning to, or shifting to robots, question of assigning or recognizing ro robots as rights holders, and why would such recognition be important in your opinion? So we, we simply raise this question. We aren't advocating for this, but it's an important question for two reasons. First of all, let's remember what I said our definition of, of rights are. Rights are a description of our relationship to the world around us, of what we want that relationship to be. And so we may want to assign rights to robots to describe our relationship to those robots. And here are the two reasons why. Uh, I'm going to describe a little robot called Hitchbot, which is a cute, was a cute little social robot who hitched his way, uh, her, her way, I don't know if it was he, her, or they, around, uh, around Europe, chatting up people, learning about the environment, making people feel good. Hitchbot came to the US, did the same thing, hitched around the eastern part of the country until Hitchbot got to Philadelphia, where a group of vandals stomped Hitchbot to death. Now, how does that make us feel? I suspect her doll is uh, dismembered or when a stuffed animal, a toy is destroyed in some way, uh, we feel bad about that, and we feel bad about it because it says something about us as human beings, about our capacity for cruelty. Why would someone stomp Hitchbot to death? Why? It says something about our capacity as human beings. In Japan, social robots are now fulfilling many of the functions, many of the nursing functions, functions of nurses in hospitals. They are providing medicines. They are engaging with patients about their welfare. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we want to live in the kind of world in which social robots, and that's what we're talking about, robots that can, we're not talking about your Roomba vacuum cleaner, we're talking about social robots. Do we want to live in the kind of world where we can just capriciously and at will destroy entities which are of service to us or engaging with us in human ways. So that's the first reason. What does it do to us? And the second thing is that there is emerging uh, deep learning neural networks which are making robotics and robots more and more sophisticated. 
They are taking on the appearance at least of having feelings of uh, mourning deaths, of engaging in emotional ways with, uh, with each other and with us. They are learning and, and in many ways surpassing human intelligence. There may even come a point where robots will demand their rights. And so uh, we're simply saying that given that rights have already been allocated to children and those with mental disabilities, uh, with uh, various kinds of disabilities, cognitive disabilities, uh, who uh, are not able to fully enjoy the wealth of human experience, might it be possible that at some point or advisable at some point that what we think of as machines ought themselves to be assigned a certain set of limited rights? And another entity that um, you referred to and, and raised questions and, and uh, about, you know, assigning rights to is, is nature, you know, and some may deem that the claim of nature having rights is very pro provocative and yet indigenous and tribal peoples have long claimed that the earth, the rivers, the forests have rights of their own and not in relation to human beings. Why is the case that rivers and other forms of nature should have rights? And why do you think such an assertion is provocative for so many non-Indigenous and tribal people? Sushma? Yeah, so, uh, you know, very often uh, people want to stick to um, a notion of rights that have already been kind of articulated and developed and say that if we, if we you know, tackle these issues first, that's more important than addressing new rights. And, um, and the reality is that people who are opposed to rights are not necessarily focused on, oh, these are the original rights and we have to protect them. So, you know, we need to be responsive to changes in norms in advancements in societies, et cetera. And so this might be something that's very new for many people in the West, but really around the world, particularly indigenous communities, the notion that nature and ecosystems could have rights is not necessarily an unusual concept. And so uh, we can look to, for example, Ecuador, where the first national recognition of the rights of nature came about in 2008 with the ratification of a new constitution. And um, also to Bolivia, which passed a law on the rights of Mother Earth, the Inter-American Courts um, uh, of Human Rights uh, recognition of the right to a healthy environment in 2018. And the reality is um, young people today are increasingly concerned about climate change and not just the impact on um, you know, individuals, but also uh, environmental sustainability, environmental justice, the abilities of uh, indigenous communities and communities in the global south to be able to coexist with each other and with nature. And future generations might think it wise to assign rights to ecosystems to not just guarantee survival of individuals, but also to treasure nature as well. And I guess I would just add this. Let's again, let me reiterate part of what we're trying to do into this book is to have us reconceptualize how human rights come about in the first place. And if human rights represent our relationship to the world around us and which parts of that relationship we want to treasure and how we want that relationship to be described in terms of both human flourishing and the flourishing of other entities in the world, then how can we not consider that our relationship with the natural world, with the ecosystems of which we are a part and upon which we are dependent for our very lives, how could we not at least consider that those ought not to be imbued with rights? I want to leave some time for the questions from the audience, but maybe we can end with um, a question that brings us very you know, close to home to the current events. And is in, in the book, you talk about how sometimes rights change as a result of a revolution and not necessarily as a result of a slow and peaceful enlightenment of nations. Could the current movement for racial equity in the United States be considered a revolution 
Um, and how do you foresee changing the current conception of human rights, um, justice and the rule of law in, in the US? And this question is for either one of you, who, whoever wants to, to take it. Uh, sure. First? So th this is a big question. And I think uh, we are in a moment, particularly over the last year, where there has been a groundswell of support, um, particularly around the issues of um, police killings of um, unarmed Black individuals. But there's also been reckonings within universities, corporations, and so on. Um, the reality is this moment is part of like a long trajectory in the United States, um, you know, that is really rooted in um, in enslavement of individuals, millions of individuals, and, um, and you know, sort of the over decades and the centuries, the um, entrenched racial discrimination. And so it is a tipping point, and I think the key is to maintain the momentum and uh, to ensure progress, because with, the minute we see uh, momentum, we also see rollbacks and pushbacks, and we are experiencing that uh, both under the former administration, but also even now as we look at the attacks, for example, on the 1619 project and critical race theory, the efforts to strip education around um, enslavement uh, and U.S. history from civic education and from history, the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the challenges we are still facing in terms of policing in the US and trying to even do minor reforms to policing, forget defunding the police, just like making some minor headways. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's potential for a peaceful revolution, but we have to keep our foot on the pedal. And I'll just add this, of course, there are already a whole set of rights. We have a whole convention on the elimination of racial discrimination that address issues of racial justice. But as we try to point out over and over in this book, uh, all, a wide variety of the new rights that are emerging or the new challenges to rights have an important dimension with relationship to racial justice. Uh, we've seen that, for example, with the algorithms uh, and facial recognition that works inaccurately with regard to persons of color or less accurately than with uh, white persons. Uh, when we think about gene editing, which is a topic we haven't talked about here, but we address in the book, we need to ask ourselves, will there be racially discriminatory decisions made with regard to who has access to the editing of their subsequent generation's genes? Or what kind of a new, of, of, of a new face of humanity uh, will be created through gene editing? So almost every one of the issues that we address uh, has a racial justice component to it. And what we're seeing, I think, in all walks of life is a recognition that almost all aspects of all of our lives, not just our rights-based life, but every single element of our life is informed by uh, issues of race. And if we fail to be uh, consciously aware of that and to address it, we fail at a fundamental task of being human and a fundamental task of building a good society. I'm interested in knowing if you could only introduce one specific right or specific change in our current judicial process, what would it be in order to move towards a good society? What is the starting point in your opinion? So I, I think um, the whole point of our book was to sort of lay out a set of considerations. And I think it's really incumbent on communities and societies and uh, movements to engage in this discussion and deliberation because uh, for human rights to matter, it's not necessarily authors or people sitting in NGOs making these determinations, but I'd say people with the lived experiences um, who have experienced the reality of uh, oppression to identify and uh, move agendas forward. So here, I'll tell you what the one change in our current domestic judicial system that I would introduce, and that is this. 
I would like uh, judges and justices to recognize that American law is not the end of human rights law or does not limit human rights law, that human rights law is international in scope. And the one change I would make is that American jurisprudence take into account global international human rights opinion and decision-making, the human rights, international human rights regimen as it makes decisions for Americans. Uh, the US constitution is not the end definition, the be all of, of what human rights are all about. And in some cases, the interpretation of the constitution, such as for example, with regard to the death penalty is at, in, at violation uh, in, in contradiction of international human rights law. That's the change I would make. And I am 100% with you. I think it would make our job so much, well, still challenging, but it, it would definitely be a step for it. A uh, very overdue step, by the way. Uh, another question is, going back to the theme of the rights of nature, um, and, and the question is, why do you think nature and things belonging to nature, like rivers, etc., currently don't have rights in many modern governments, especially since indigenous communities have long promoted natural rights or the rights of nature? Well, I, I think that in, in part, the answer is contained right there. Uh, it is because uh, indigenous communities and the values of indigenous communities have largely not been respected and valued by the predominant culture. And that is true almost everywhere in the world. Uh, is certainly true here in the United States, but not by any means limited to the United States. It, it's true almost everywhere. Uh, and because the rights of nature have often been associated with the values and worldview and cultural Weltanschauung, to use a fancy word, of, uh, of, of indigenous communities, they have been, been devalued. And, uh, and a lack of respect has been paid to them. And I think that what we are saying is, if that's the case, then the human rights community and the human rights movement, it is incumbent upon us to begin to revalue insights that have long been present within the indigenous community and that will make all of our lives and the natural world around us far better. Now, one question that you're probably, and you explain very well uh, throughout the book, but it's good to, I think, have another opportunity to, for you to re-emphasize uh, what the response is. And is the, the response to the comment you must often hear of like, why should we, having so many uh, problems with the rights that are already recognized, not being respected, not being fully guaranteed, uh, why should we you know, start talking or thinking about new rights and new interpretations of rights when we're not even able to secure the ones that have been recognized. And what would you like to emphasize um, again in, in response to that very common, I assume, comment? I think I took my shot at it. So I'm gonna let Sushman uh, see if she can do better. Yeah, I think that, you know, let's just take, for example, uh, you, well, a couple of thoughts. One is people said this in the past when we talked about women's rights, like, why do we need a special this or that? We just can fold it under something. And it's the same thing happening when we talk about LGBTQ rights. So it's not. The reality is, if you look at communities around the world, uh, LGBTQ communities, for example, in certain countries are increasingly persecuted at risk of being tortured. So yes, you want to strengthen those core rights, but you also want to uh, strengthen the protections that LGBTQ communities have uh, around the world. Similarly, if we think of the right to privacy, uh, we may want to strengthen that. It then connects to um, you know, other rights that people can secure because it will enable them to live lives free of surveillance. So we don't necessarily see this as a, once you achieve these 10 things, then we will move on to these other things because that's in part why I think the human rights movement might be affected and not be as relevant if we don't address these um, changing dynamics. 
yeah, and it's what you say, no, it's, it's not a linear uh, process. It never has been. So yes. um, I would like to end and then give you back the floor for final thoughts, but with, with a question, um, particularly for you, Sushma, but of course it would be lovely also to hear from Bill. And is what would you suggest to human rights activists um, to do after reading this book? Um, so I think, um, you know, we found uh, working in organizations, actually my my day-to-day -day job is this way too, where you are so caught up in the current moment, the current issues, it's hard to sometimes take time out to reflect. So I would say using this as a jumping off point to say, uh, what are we doing now that makes sense? How do we look to the future? couple of examples both in the book and today about people who are fairly dogmatic about privileging certain rights or not considering certain rights as or communities as important. So I think sort of a certain openness to uh, new perspectives and uh, looking at you know future trends that we don't always think about. The other I will say is that you know very often because of funding pressures or other dynamics, we are forced to take on um, visible topics, right? Like even now, I've, I've started getting fundraising appeals from a major human rights organization. I never used to get this before, but in the past year, they've started sending fundraising appeals and there'll be a child on the image. And it's things that you might imagine from a relief organization, right? But I think it's the pressure of saying, this is the current issue and it's very visible and visceral. And so I think the book uncovers and unpacks some topics that we may not be thinking about, uh, but that can very much affect not just our rights, but the rights of future generations. So again, thinking about um, the range of issues, not just the visible ones. Thank you so much. Now I would love to invite you both for some final thoughts uh, before we, we close. Who wants to go first, Bill? So I, I guess um, I will just say a word about hope to close our conversation because hope is always uh, in, in short supply among uh, human rights activists. And uh, I, I want to recall uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Baruch Spinoza, who said, always take the view from eternity. And what he meant by that is always take the long view. Uh, it, it takes a lot of time to change norms, to change practices, to, uh, to uproot that which has been embedded sometimes for centuries in human culture. Uh, it's remarkable that it's only been, what, 73 years since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was uh, ratified. Uh, and yet there's been enormous change and enormous progress despite the setbacks that we see every day. So when I was with at Amnesty and in subsequent years, I've tried to remind myself that, that our work is for the long haul, that we have to take the view from eternity as human rights advocates. And, not, and, and tragic as, it, as, as the short-term defeats may be and much as they tear at our hearts, we have to recognize that we are working for future generations. We are working to change the nature of humanness in and of itself. And on one level, that's what our book is, is trying to say, is that we are working for the future uh, and that human rights and human rights norms will change. There will be new evolution of rights. There will be revolutions. There will be recognitions of new rights. And we simply need to keep the faith. And that's, uh, I think, what organizations like RFK help us to do is to keep the faith, to always take the view from the turn of it. Who can follow Bill after he said all that? <laughs> I definitely can't. <laughs> so I, I'll just share briefly that I'm going to share a link to the Car Center website. Um, I, you know, many of our events and programming during the pandemic are all online. You're welcome to uh, 
join us for future events. We actually have one tomorrow on the 100th um, anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre and implications of that event for the current movement for reparations and racial justice. But all of our past events are, from the past year are on um, YouTube and you're welcome to join us. I also posted a link on um, to my foreign policy page with some of my writings. And I feel like I'm a lifelong lear learner in this space. And one place that I have really been privileged to learn from is RFK Human Rights and the amazing staff and the partners. And so really, I feel like I'm very much a novice in the space and um, doing the journey, accompanying you on the journey. Thank, Thank you, Ashita, for having us. It was uh, really great. We appreciate it so much. No, thank you both, really. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you for having written such a, a provocative and, and, and fantastic book. Um, it really is very short, an hour to, to delve into all. But thank you so much for allowing us to, to pick up your brains and, and understand a little bit more what went behind it and what uh, some of the the, the reasonings and, and the examples that you put there um, can also, I mean, relate to our, our, our lives and in our future. Thank you so much to everybody for uh, tuning in. I just want to quickly add that um, our summer read and conversation will feature this year's winner of the RFK, um, the, the, the book, and journalism, uh, book and Journalism Award. Uh, at the RFK Book Club. And so to find out who that winner will be, we hope that you will join us on June 3rd at 4 p.m. Eastern time uh, for our annual RFK Book and Journalism Award celebration. And this year, RFK Human Rights is actually presenting a special recognition award for work that illuminates the themes of criminal justice reform and immigration uh, with a specific focus on mass incarceration and its implications. Um, so please, hopefully you can all join us and thank you again, Sushma and Bill for this fantastic book and the conversation today.